Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Know Before You Go, Grand Canyon, Bryce, and Zion National Parks. Presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader, Hayden Deering. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Take it away, Caden. Good day, everybody. Um, as Rob mentioned, uh, my name is Caden Deering. Um, just to start off with a little introduction about myself, um, there's a picture uh, from my hometown there in Ogden, Utah. Uh, born and raised. Um, just a few hours north of this beautiful area we're going to be talking about today. Um, I still live there today. Um, grown up in Ogden, Utah. I've um, been uh, traveling down, if anyone knows, the St. George area, which is the largest town closest to Bryce, Zion, and the north rim of the Grand Canyon. i um, been going there since I was very, very young. Um, and, uh, I've been guiding for NatHab for about two and a half years now. Um, so I've been around the block and uh, the wonderful thing about this, this trip in the, in the canyons of the Southwest is it feels like my backyard. Um, so, uh, wonderful, wonderful to be here today. I'm actually phoning in from, uh, some personal travel in South Korea. So here it is 4 AM, which is wonderful. You can see it's dark outside. Um, but happy to be here. And uh, again, uh, yeah, I've been in the area uh, quite a long time. Um, I am the, uh, the lead guide uh, for natural habitat adventures in the area. So I have a lot to do with uh, building out the itinerary, um, training new guides, um, and being an active support throughout the season. Um, so I, I think I only have uh, just a handful of, uh, of trips down in the Southwest this year. Um, but I will have a hand um, throughout the season um, in the area. Um, as I mentioned, I, I went to school at Utah State University. Um, I studied religion and anthropology. And so human history in the area is something that I like to talk about quite a bit when I travel. Um, you know, Mormon history, uh, Native American history, Paiute history, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, um, that's a little bit about me. Um, and we'll get going here. Um, as Rob mentioned, we're here, know before you go, Grand Canyon, Bryce, and Zion and National Parks. Um, and we'll get right into it. So, of course, I have to throw this side slide here at the beginning. This is our uh, COVID protocols. Um, you know, I, I'm hoping this is the last year I have to include this slide, but I figured I might as well toss it in there. Um, as many of you are probably natural habitat adventures, seasoned travelers, um, you know, kind of, uh, where we're at currently, um, you know, we are, uh, running our trips, you know, in regards to COVID according to local guidelines and in Utah, Northern Arizona, they're just about the same as everywhere else in the United States. Um, nothing is required per se. Uh, we're no longer testing day one of the trip, um, for sickness. Um, but if uh, any one of our guests shows signs or symptoms, um, we won't. Uh, we will test if asked. So that will only be if you if you ask us. We do uh, have a couple of those tests lying around, um, typically on a trip, uh, or you can get them pretty easily. We can get one for you um, if you would like. If you do not want to, then you do not have to. Um, to test um, unless that uh, we have kind of, I, I should say, a reasonable suspicion of um, a COVID diagnosis, um, and then we will ask you to test. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, at this point in time, I'm going to be honest, um, you all probably know it's mostly just kind of cold symptoms. Um, there's not a lot of severe cases, and so it is not a present and um, danger, you know, and so a lot of times they just present as regular cold symptoms, which can be overcome with a little bit of medication and some rest on a trip. Um, and so that's kind of, that's kind of how we've been dealing with that. Um, and I would just highly recommend that when you travel, maybe wear a mask on the plane, if that's suits your fancy and you, um, think that that works for you. 
Um, I, uh, as I mentioned, have been South Korea currently and, of course, traveled about 16 hours to get here and spent three or four four days on the first end of my trip uh, with a little bit of a cold. Um, and I'm kind of regretting not taking a couple extra precautions at the beginning of my trip. And that's pretty common, being in a stuffed little, little plane, you know, um, and traveling. Pretty common to do that. So um, just a recommendation, of course, not a requirement, uh, but something to bring up. Moving on. Uh, I love this quote. If anyone's familiar with Edward Abbey, um, very popular writer of the uh, Southwest region. Um, if uh, you are one of those lucky individuals to be able to travel to the canyons of the Southwest this year with us, um, you'll receive a, uh, a reading list of a couple of books to peruse. Um, this particular quote comes from his book, uh, Desert Solitaire. And uh, that is a uh, kind of a memoir style book, uh, very amazing language in there of his year spent as a backcountry forest or uh, excuse me, park ranger in Arches National Park, um, which is just a hop, skip and jump over the mountains, not on our itinerary, but quite similar to the area we travel in. The quote, the wind will not stop. Gusts of sand whirl before me stinging my face, but there is still too much to see and marvel at. The world very much alive in the bright light and wind, exultant with the fever of spring, the delight of morning. Strolling on, it seems to me that the strangeness and wonder of existence are emphasized here in the desert by the comparative sparsity of the flora and fauna. Life not crowded upon life as in other places, but scattered abroad in sparseness and simplicity, with a generous gift of space for each herb and bush and tree, each stem of grass, so that the living organism stands out bold and brave and vivid against the lifeless sand and barren rock. The extreme clarity of the desert light is equaled by the extreme individuation of desert life forms. Love flowers best in open and freedom. Where are we headed? A little bit of context here. So as you can see here uh, in my uh, graphic, um, we're talking about the Colorado Plateau. If you notice there on my little map, um, there's a little bit of a star on the middle left section there. Um, that is St. George, Utah down right about 10 minutes from the Arizona and Nevada border on either side. Um, St. George, Utah is a special little place. Um, well, not so little as it once was actually. Um, quite the little, uh, you know, quite the uh, sizable town nowadays, um, but it sits at the, the junction of three large ecosystems. Um, one of them being highlighted here, uh, the Colorado Plateau. Um, the other two being the Great Basin Desert, um, which extends north and to the west of St. George, and the Mojave Desert, which extends to the south and the west of St. George. So a great junction of three of the largest um, ecosystems of the southwest here. Excuse me. But you'll notice that... Um, our three national parks are contained mostly within the Colorado Plateau. Um, there you can see on the uh, close to the star on that left side, Bryce Canyon National Park, um, just up north and to the east. Um, Zion National Park is not highlighted, but you can see there's actually uh, the closest small green space to that star is Zion National Park. I'm not sure why the name isn't there. And then, of course, uh, further to the south, we have what we call the Big Ditch. Um, Grand Canyon National Park um, right down there. You know, the Colorado Plateau raised up at about, from, well, started about um, 80, 100 million years ago um, and has uh, been raising up until about 20 million years ago. And it uh, is a large, large elevated heart-shaped plateau um, that was uh, raised up um, during a geologic event called the Laramide Orogeny, and that's just a fancy word for uh, the event of the Pacific Plate subducting underneath the North American Plate. Of course, um, 
causing all sorts of friction further in. This created the raising of the Rocky Mountains as well as the raising of the Colorado Plateau and various other formations throughout the West um, and created basically this giant heart-shaped plateau thousands of feet up above the rest of the surrounding area. Um, and that has, uh, of course, created all this beautiful um, elevated canyon country that has been, um, you know, elevated, down cut, and eroded away. And that's where we get these beautiful, beautiful canyons. Um, that's where we're talking about today. Uh, I won't go too much into the Nastro history. Of course, if you travel with us this year or any other year, um, we'll get a little bit more into it as we're out there. But Canyon Country, we're talking about rocks and geology. Uh, a couple of slight trip details I wanted to uh, lay before you guys at the beginning here. Um, the Our Canyons trip is, and I, you know, we used to talk about, uh, nowadays it's called the Bryce, Zion, and Grand Canyon um, trip. I might refer to it as the Canyon Strip. That was the old name. Um, so excuse my uh, um, old reference, um, but I will use those interchangeably. Um, we're talking about eight days. Um, and so total, that'll be eight days of the trip, including uh, one travel day on either end um, and two days, typically about two days. It ends up being maybe a day and then three quarters, you know, with uh, traveling in and out of the parks, but about two days in each, um, Bryce being the first, Zion second, and then of course the Grand Canyon third. Um, as many of you know, the number of travelers on our trips range for, ranges from about 10, um, capped at 10 for our photography departures. For those of you who are uh, interested in uh, photography and a little bit more photography focus, um, and to about 13 capped on our uh, natural tours. Um, and that's typical, you know, um, that is, of course, the max. Um, there are trips occasionally um, in less busy parts of the season that we'll get about, you know, seven, eight, nine, um, but that's not necessarily typical. And then I, I throw this physical requirement in here. This is a language actually found on the Natural Habitat website, and uh, I will actually read it um, to you word for word here. This adventure does not require a high degree of physical fitness. However, in order to participate, travelers should be able to walk at least two miles unassisted over uneven terrain and inclines with some altitude gain. And at altitudes up to 9,115 feet above sea level. An optional mule ride is available for participants weighing less than 200 pounds on our North Rim itinerary. Most of the trip takes place in an arid desert environment, and the sun can often be intense. Our days generally start quite early and are very full with activities, including a few long drives. While, dry, while travelers are not required to participate in all activities, should you opt out of the day's scheduled activities, we cannot always guarantee that alternatives will be available. Um, I should mention uh, one of my favorite hikes of the trip, which I will go into here momentarily, um, is about three miles, um, a little bit under three miles. Um, so, uh, and that is kind of a, a staple of our itinerary and has been for several years. Um, and that includes about 600 feet up and down uh, there at Bryce Canyon National Park. And what's great about the Bryce Canyon hike is that we get to be among the wonderful geologic features there um, known as hoodoos. And that really is a highlight of the trip. Um, and so you're gonna, if you're going to be traveling with, this, with us this year, and that's up at about 8,000 feet um, above sea level. So that's kind of our, our most difficult um, hike on this trip. Definitely worth it. Um, definitely something to be training for um, if, this is, if this is your trip this year. Um, but uh, some things to keep in mind. Um, it's not, definitely not, I also guide up in Glacier and we do, I think about one to two hikes every day. And it's not, it's not quite that trip, um, but, um, but we do some wonderful, meaningful hikes um, that are definitely worth uh, keeping in mind. Beautiful. Let's talk about it. Here we have uh, a beautiful photo of Grand Canyon um, National Park. This isn't a typical photo of Grand Canyon National Park that you'll find really anywhere on the internet. Um, this is one that I took. Um, one of my very first trips uh, many years ago to the Grand Canyon, um, where there was a very, um, I, had, I got very lucky, and this was an, an inversion 
um, up through the Grand Canyon. So you can see the pinnacles peeking up. Um, some be beautiful little fall foliage there. Um, there, um, I think it was about uh, start to mid October at the time I took this photo. And uh, just a really unique view of the Grand Canyon. Uh, one of my favorite places there. So beautiful sight there. That's what we'll be talking about. Um, here we have a sunrise at Bryce Canyon National Park. Another photo of mine as well. Um, just a beautiful sunrise. Probably my favorite sunrise in all the many places I've traveled. Um, absolutely stunning. You can see some really nice reflections on the hoodoos down there. Those are those pinnacle geologic formations I mentioned earlier. Um, and just some really nice light cutting through the canyon. Definitely a highlight of the trip. Um, and here we have one of the most iconic shots of Zion National Park. This is actually looking south out of the canyon mouth down there along the Virgin River. You can see cutting through the middle of my shot. Um, and then uh, a peak known as the Watchman being illuminated in the setting sun. Um, we'll spend, uh, you know, talking about sunrises and sunsets. These are some beautiful times to be out in canyon country. Um, beautiful light on the red rock. And you get... Of course, those beautiful reds, oranges, purples, yellows, even greens of the oasis of Zion all popping in these photos. Just a little bit of a taste of the places that we'll be seeing and talking about today. Um, kind of getting into it, I don't want to, uh, you know, take you too much through the entire itinerary, but to kind of throw some uh, throw some big activities at you. Um, one of my favorite things that we're able to do up at Bryce Canyon is a helicopter ride around the rim. Um, we work with a local uh, family-owned um, airport service up there. Actually, they own, to my knowledge, the oldest still-in-use log hangar of any airport in the U.S. today. Um, and they uh, have been running their business there for many, many years. They're a great little family um, that run helicopter tours of Bryce Canyon. Um, of course, weather permitting. Um, we don't like to be up there when it's too windy, um, but they are fantastic, um, fantastic pilots, and they take us all the way around the rim. You know, Bryce Canyon is a bit of a misnomer. It's more of a Bryce amphitheater, and that would be owing to uh, really more of erosive edges on all sides of a plateau rather than a canyon um, being cut down um, by a river or something like that. Uh, definitely a highlight, helicopter ride. Um, there you go, the Queen's Garden Loop. That was uh, the hike I mentioned earlier. Definitely a highlight of the trip. Something to train for up at about 8,000 feet. It's about three miles, about 650 feet of loss and gain. That is down into those hoodoos I showed you a picture of momentarily ago. Excuse me. Got a little bit of a sinus thing going on. Um, definitely a highlight. Uh, really, really great Queen's Garden Loop. Um, we also head up to... The end of the plateau out to Rainbow and Yovimpa points, um, which are up at about, th those are the tallest point of the trip up there at about 9,100 feet. Um, and the, uh, you can actually see the rise of the Grand Canyon Plateau, or the Kaibab Plateau from the top of Bryce Canyon. And so really amazing open vistas there um, at the top of Bryce couple of Bryce Canyon activities there. As I mentioned, hoodoos. This is our unique geologic feature of Bryce Canyon National Park. This particular one is yeah. named Thor's Hammer. You can see right there in the center, that top piece looks a little bit like a hammer, if you stretch your imagination a little bit. Um, and this is the beginning of that Queen's Garden Loop. So you can imagine um, hiking down below the rim into this beautiful maze of orange, white, and pink rock is really just stunning. Um, amazing turns, uh, amazing views around every turn. I was there about two weeks ago with uh, with a couple. Um, it asked me to guide them down there, and uh, this was the highlight of their trip, um, this hike. And so just some amazing hoodoos. It really is, Bryce Canyon is quite a personable, charismatic park, a very accessible, um, a maze to be explored, really. A couple of wildlife features uh, we can expect maybe to see um, right there on the top left. That's a Utah prairie dog. 
local endangered species, um, the Utah prairie dog, mostly due to habitat loss um, uh, by encroaching of grazing lands um, and ranchers mostly, um, as well as uh, prairie dogs actually contract the bubonic plague. That's the black plague that we talked about in uh, ancient Europe there. Well, ancient, yeah, middle age Europe, I should say. Um, but cute little critters, uh, they have a very short season. Um, you know, they don't like to be out when the snow, the snow is out. And so typically, typically we'll see them about, you know, mid-May they'll pop out, conditions depending, and then they'll, and then they'll eat their fill um, right there at Bryce Canyon and pop back into hibernating, um, you know, about mid-August. So there, it's a pretty quick season. Um, wow, September sometimes as well. So um, those time, those guys we'll see uh, fairly often. And there at the bottom right, we have a uh, American pronghorn, um, antelope uh, for another uh, another name. Beautiful creatures. I like to call them the uh, Wyoming Silver Streak. It's the, the second fastest land animal in the world. Um, can run up to about 65 miles per hour. Just a beautiful creature, silver streak on the landscape. We can expect to see those a um, little bit longer of a, of a season than the Utah Prairie Dog. Beautiful wildlife of a Bryce Canyon. Um, let's get into Zion, Zion National Park. Um, as I mentioned, Zion is a canyon proper um, cut by the Virgin River. And so our first order of agenda is walking down by the Virgin River. And uh, this is up to the mouth of the Narrows there in Zion National Park. Um, the Narrows being a very famous section of the Virgin River. Um, you know, Navajo sandstone is a quite dense sandstone. Um, it's very good for rock climbing. And uh, up in the Narrows, uh, it's very famous for coming right up to the river. So you'll be in sections of the river, um, not on our trip typically, um, but if that is something that you're very interested in that is very easily accommodated by our expedition leaders. Um, I have sent people up um, with hiking poles and river shoes um, before. It'll the only problem being uh, kind of a mobility issue. You know, you're going to be the uh, narrows hike is uh, through the river itself, and so you're walking along slick, round river rocks. Um, I did it many, many years ago. A while worthwhile hike. Um, definitely hard on the ankles and knees. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. That um, suspended, what we will do as a group is a Virgin River walk, which is a nice paved one mile walk up to the Narrows. Um, definitely the narrowest part of the canyon there. Um, up along the uh, Hanging Gardens of Zion National Park, some really beautiful endemic species of, of uh, fauna there along the river, um, definitely worthwhile. Um, usually a couple, well, quite a bit of people there. Um, our next hike being the Emerald Pools hike. Um, this is uh, something, uh, another beautiful hike there um, in Zion National Park. It's about a mile to two and a half miles, excuse me, again. Um, you know, the Emerald Pools hike in years past has been a little bit easier um, from the Zion Lodge. Um, but uh, during the flooding of our just amazing uh, winter season we had last year, um, at the end of 2023, I want to say, uh, one of the bridges actually washed out. And so it's become a little longer um, at about depending on where you start from, where your uh, expedition leader deems um, most uh, relevant. It can be from about a mile and a half to about two miles, mostly paved uh, on large sections, uh, but definitely worth it. Some beautiful pools and a little bit of waterfalls, obviously more water in the springtime, less so in the late fall, September time, uh, but definitely still worth it. Um, as well as the Perouche Trail. These are just some names to throw at you in case anyone wants to kind of look these up and see what they're getting themselves into. The Perouche Trail is a nice trail that enters the uh, the mouth of the park there and um, kind of crosses the Virgin River several times. And it is a great time to go take that photo of the Watchmen I showed you a little bit earlier um, up at sunset. So some really nice, really nice birding out there on the Perouche Trail as well. 
A um, couple of really nice shots. You know, Zion National Park is notoriously difficult to photograph, and this particular photo I do like. Um, you know, we're talking 2,000 foot Navajo sandstone cliff sides. Absolutely amazing. And we're down there at the bottom. You can see the, the, the ribbon of the Virgin River there at the bottom of this photo on the left. Um, just a really beautiful day. Um, and I love this photo. Just an oasis, really, of the desert um, there in Zion National Park. Just beautiful. Um, there on the right, that's one of those endemic uh, flowers I was talking about. That's called Zion Shooting Star. And, of course, uh, seasonally dependent. Um, but a beautiful bloomer uh, early, I would say early to summer to about midsummer. Um, these guys will be out um, just really gorgeous. Um, endemic, for those who are not familiar, meaning a species that exists only within a certain area. So this particular flower species does not grow in anywhere else in the world other than Zion National Park. And that's pretty cool. Um, another couple of critters we might run into right there on the left, uh, really actually a great uh, recovery story, the Desert Bighorn. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep, um, but these are Desert Bighorn Sheep, a uh, smaller, thinner, desert-adapted cousin of the Rocky Mountain Bighorn. You can see they're a little bit thinner. Um, there's a couple of U's in this shot here, um, but definitely... Uh, lovers of some low grade rocky terrain you know they they typically hang out up on those rocks there uh, mostly to avoid predators mountain lions namely being the, the big one and coyotes um, but uh, these critters were mostly extinct out of the park due to um, disease um, from domestic sheep and over hunting back um, in the 19th century and they were reintroduced back in the 80s and 90s and have flourished so they're about couple thousand in Zion National Park. We have a pretty good chance of seeing those guys. Um, just saw a couple of lambs drop a couple weeks ago, and that was my first for me, so that was really fun. Um, but uh, they've actually been moving them out of the park into different areas, reintroducing them back into different areas of Utah because there's so many. So that's a pretty good chance for those guys. Really good, fun photos with the red rock background, obviously. Um, there on the right, too, we have our what's called a canyon tree frog. These little gray critters uh, like to come out in the early summer um, to breed, and they actually sound like sheep. Um, funnily enough, um, they'll be out um, bleeding, as I like to say, um, in the uh, river bottoms of the Virgin River and the tributaries there, and sometimes in the emerald pools. Obviously, again, seasonally dependent, um, but these guys can be seen through most part of the summer, um, if not heard. Um, fun little critters to keep our eyes out um, for. Moving on to Grand Canyon, just again, uh, just a small smattering. These are kind of more notes for me rather than actual reading points. Um, you know, in years past, we've actually been going to the South Rim um, of the Grand Canyon, which many of you have probably gone to. That is definitely the more uh, developed section of the Grand, of Grand Canyon National Park. Um, but this being a natural habitat adventures tour, uh, we're not going, we're trying not to go where the people are. We're going to uh, where the nature is, and that is the North Rim. Um, and uh, we have been kind of moving our departures out of the shoulder season nowadays. And so uh, we're not, uh, not having so many departures in April and um, late October, November anymore. And so we've uh, actually removed our South Rim itineraries, um, which I think is a fantastic move that was a very very long drive for that last day and so i'm very very ecstatic that we're just we're just going to be at the north room this year really really good stuff um and another thing being as well you know last year there was again an amazing amazing winter that we really needed out west here um, a lot of water that was very necessary However, a couple of downsides, there was a huge landslide at the North Rim last year that actually took out the water pipe um, that, that provides um, all of the water, all the potable water to the North Rim, actually from about halfway down the Grand Canyon. Um, and that um, basically made it impossible to stay at the North Rim. We're expecting to be able to stay at the North Rim Lodge this year. Um, again, um, they have been able to fix the water situation and be able to have us back down there. Last year was a little bit difficult, so pretty excited about this year. 
Um, the North Rim Lodge is really beautiful. I have a photo here later I'll show you um, in the in the sh slideshow. Um, just right on the rim, about a hundred year old lodge. Um, just a wonderful place to stay. They've got a bunch of cabins that kind of litter the area too. We sometimes stay in. Actually, those are what we always stay in. There are no rooms in the lodge itself, just a dining room and some viewing areas. Um, but we do stay in the cabins there, which is really wonderful. Um, one of my favorite, you know, I'm, I will just kind of tickle your curiosity, I should say. Um, we uh, get to spend a pretty early morning there um, doing a sunrise activity there at the Grand Canyon. Uh, we have a, a nice little spot that we've scoped out over the years that's pretty remote. And so depending on the sunrise at the time of the year of your travel, um, we'll be getting up at uh, the early early uh, cracks of dawn in the morning to be able to travel out to our beautiful sunrise, take some beautiful photos, do a little bit of a hike in a rather remote section of Grand Canyon National Park. Um, we've been seeing, you know, a, little, a few more people over the years as they've kind of discovered our spot, um, but it really is um, just a serene experience that sunrise morning. Few things greater than a desert sunrise, I'll tell you what. Um, we'll be doing that, you know, as I mentioned, the mule ride is something that people really enjoy. Um, that is our opportunity to drop below the rim here on the North Rim. Um, you know, uh, that is something that a lot of people, uh, really love getting into and, um, the trailheads at the North Rim being a little bit more remote. Um, sometimes we're not able to do that outside of the mule ride. So it's definitely something to look forward to. Excuse me. And that is, uh, a, you know, we work with a, a local contractor there at the North Rim Lodge to uh, provide for those mule rides. So really great opportunity. Um, we will, you know, provide some good time for a rim hike there at the top of the rim or right around the North Rim um, with some interpretation and some uh, beautiful views, of course, just not a lot of people. Um, great time at the Grand Canyon. Uh, a couple of critters we might be able to spot. A uh, pretty famous one there. Uh, this is a photo taken from uh, one of the uh, guides that trained me a couple years ago, an old uh, expedition leader for Nat Have His name's Matt Turner. You can see um, just giving credit where credit's due on that photo. Um, really wonderful guide um, in the Southwest for many, many years. Um, great California condor photo. Um, beautiful. Look at that head. Isn't that just a pretty bugger there? Um, just charismatic birds just really really pretty another uh ongoing restoration project not quite as successful as the desert bighorn unfortunately um, but the population of california condor um, that do live on the arizona utah border numbers about 100 we lost um, i want to say about 16 last year to uh, avian flu which was very unfortunate um, but there is still a healthy population there. Um, not, you know, there being, I, I should say, there was about 96 um, at the start of the season last year. I haven't looked at numbers quite this year, but they should be around there. Um, but um, rare to see, can be difficult to see sometimes. Really beautiful birds though. Um, we'll, be, we'll be looking out for them, for sure. And then uh, right there on the right, that is a, uh, a squirrel. Um, a Kaibab ground squirrel, uh, Kaibab being the name of the North Plateau of the Grand Canyon. So that's the, uh, where we'll be is the Kaibab Plateau. And these critters, they love to be up in the treetops. Um, and so they can also be difficult to spot. Um, some rare sightings, of these two guys, um, but definitely um, things to maybe look forward to and keep our eyes out when we're out down in Canyon Country. A couple other locations. Um, that we'll be traveling to things to, again, wet your palate. Um, here we have a beautiful photo of Kodachrome Basin State Park. This is a, a place that we'll occasionally travel to, um, weather permitting, um, down off of Bryce Canyon Plateau. Um, as you can see, uh, aptly named little state park right out in the middle of Utah. As I mentioned, I've lived in Utah for all of my 27 years and uh, did not know about this little gem of a park until I started it. Um, running this itinerary and so it's been a real treat to travel down there really nice photos beautiful red and white contrasting colors there and some uh, pretty unique geologic formations and so um, that is a great, a great place to be um, and a little addition of a state park there on one of our Bryce Canyon days 
Um, another one, uh, Snow Canyon State Park again. Uh, there's some red and white there in the in the beautiful rock. Um, this is a state park just outside of St. George um, that we'll travel to um, typically the first day and spend a little bit of time there. A little bit of volcanic activity, old basalt flows going on. Um, uh, and this is all actually Navajo sandstone again, very uh, same formation as Zion National Park, um, but just kind of a, a a nice precursor to the rest of our trip. We do maybe maybe a hike or two through through Snow Canyon there, um, outside of St. George. Beautiful. So that's kind of our uh, you know um, quick and easy itinerary overview. Um, as I mentioned, uh, a lot more. Um, that I didn't share that'll go on with throughout the trip, but just just a quick overview um, to, to let you all know. Of course, um, a lot of it is up to our individual uh, expedition leaders and their various expertise. You know, we have we have expedition leaders who have worked for NetHab for several years in the area. We have expedition leaders who have worked as Grand Canyon River guides for several years, um, and everything else in between. Um, and so I am really ecstatic about the team we have together. We're actually going to be meeting in a week or two to go over the season. Um, and it's just a great group of folks. Um, really excited about this year. Let's get a little bit more into like the logistics and what I would say the nitty gritty of the trip. Um, you know, a lot like the sand we'll be traveling through. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about climate and weather. I'm going to throw out some packing tips, some equipment, um, just some ins and outs of packing for natural habitat adventure tours, um, arrivals and departures, kind of the ins and outs of uh, I should have deleted. We're not going out of Flagstaff Airport anymore. That is uh, a leftover. I thought I got rid of all those leftovers from last year's show. Apologies. Um, but we'll be going in and out of St. George and maybe Las Vegas Airport. Um, a little bit about money, pre-departure briefing, our vehicles of the trip, accommodations, food, leave no trace, ethics, things like that. On we go. Um, first, most important thing to note, elevation changes. Um, Bryce Canyon, as I mentioned, ranges from about 8,000 to 9,000 feet. Um, Zion, as well as St. George, is at about 4,000, and the top rim being at about 7,000 feet. And then the north rim of the Grand Canyon, again, being at about 8,000 feet. So I showed a lot of the pictures of uh, beautiful, you know, sandy red rock. Um, and you're probably imagining the, the sun beating down on you from these beautiful locations. And, and that can be a little bit of a, a misleading thought, you know, up at about 9,000 feet in May, there might still be snow. Um, it can be quite cold. And moving on to this next slide, um, someone is making some noise in the background. Um, sorry, if if anyone's if they can mute themselves, appreciate that. Um, again, more into the climate and weather. It is a dry heat. Um, you know, uh, we're in the, the, the Southwest and so bring that bottle of lotion for every time you get out of the shower to keep yourself from getting ash in the skin. Um, but we do get some cold mornings, you know, um, the soil there in, uh, the Southwest region is, uh, very dry. There's not a lot of moisture that retains a lot of heat. So you get a very large temperature swing. We can get from, um, upper forties and fifties to eighties and nineties. Um, throughout the trip. And so very, very large temperature swings. Those mornings at Bryce Canyon, that sunrise especially, can be quite cold, even down into, you know, low to mid 30s some days. Um, and so as far as packing, um, these are important things to note. It can range quite a bit, especially up at a Bryce Canyon is typically the coldest part of our trip, um, with Zion being the warmest and then Grand Canyon kind of being in between. Um, but definitely lots of sun. And so we're talking uh, sun hats, wide brim hats, um, a sun shirt is a staple for me in the region. That's a long sleeve, kind of lightweight synthetic shirt with a hood um, that helps you kind of breathe and also cover and protect your skin throughout the day. Uh, important things to know um, for packing. And getting right into packing, we're talking layers, layers, layers. Um, I'm talking uh, sweat wicking, Base layer, like I said, a sun shirt is definitely uh, something I would highly recommend in the area. 
um, long sleeve um, synthetic or any kind of sweat wicking uh, uh, fiber is really, really nice. Um, of course, a mid fleece layer and then a rain shell. It does rain. We call them desert miracles. Um, but it does rain in the area occasionally. So uh, when it, my policy of rain gear is I throw a shell and maybe a pair of pants. You probably won't need rain pants in this area of the world, but if that's something you fancy, then surely pack it and throw it in the bottom of your day pack and let it live there. And it lives there, you know, basically year round. I don't ever really pull it out unless I need it. So definitely pack that. Sun hat, as I mentioned, sunglasses, chums. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that brand. I should say they're uh, just sunglass holders, you know, those nice little fabric holders you put on the back of your lenses to keep, keep them on in the wind. Great idea. Lightweight, breathable pants. Um, or shorts if you fancy. I'm a big pants guy in the desert, um, but either work light colors, of course, to to keep that sun off you. Those darker colors really like to heat up pretty quick. Um, lightweight boots or hiking shoes and make sure you break them in. Um, all of that sand moving around, it really kind of puts a strain on those uh, on those boots or sh uh, sh hiking shoes. You know, I'll wear Chacos, which are a hiking sandal, um, and that can be nice if you prefer as well. Um, any kind of like uh, Tiva or, um, you know, hiking sandal like that. We're running out of time, so I'm going to just, well, we'll keep going, but I'll just kind of um, simplify and keep going here. Uh, day pack versus a checked bag, you know, throughout the day we'll be traveling from typically about, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning to about 4 in the afternoon on any given day. Um, and so in your day pack, you're going to need all those things that you're going to need throughout the day. You know, from 8 o'clock in the morning when it's potentially 35 degrees to about 4 o'clock in the afternoon or 2 o'clock in the afternoon when it's potentially 90 degrees. So all those layers I talked about will be in your day pack, sunscreen, water bottle, camera equipment, um, extra socks, you know, medications, wallet, all that kind of stuff. That'll be in your day pack throughout the day. And then you'll have your check bag, um, which is everything else. Right? And that'll either be on a non-transfer day back in your hotel room, or that will be in our uh, field operations specialist vehicle traveling to our next location, whether that's the Zion, Bryce, or the Grand Canyon. Um, and that will not be accessible to you. And so it's important to pack. As I mentioned, I would say, uh, as illustrated here with these two items, um, a, a larger day pack, you know, about 15 liters at least, um, is, is, is preferable for all those extra items. Um, but if you're traveling with a group and you want one person to be the pack mule and everyone else to kind of travel light, that's a good way to go about it as well. Hiking poles, binoculars, and wildlife viewing scopes will be provided. We have plenty of those. Um, really nice uh, Vortex binos. If you want to bring your own, you're more than welcome to. Of course, the same with hiking poles. We will have wildlife viewing scopes for those rare times that we do see wildlife on this trip. Arrivals and departures. Uh, most guests will travel through the St. George Airport. It is a small airport with few accommodations. Uh, there is a couple of vending machines as far as food food options go, so important things to keep in mind. Um, it is some distance from the city proper. It's about 15, 20 minute drive back into St. George proper. Um, alternatively, you know, St. George Airport is pretty difficult to get to. I'm pretty sure the only airports that fly there are Denver, Phoenix, and Salt Lake. So if you're looking for more of a direct flight, I would suggest flying into Las Vegas. Um, there is a shuttle system that you can set up either on your own or through, I'm sure, the folks down at the office in Natural Habitat will help you out as well. Um, but a shuttle system that will get you from the Las Vegas airport that picks up right there and puts your right smack dab in the middle of St. George. So that can be a, a pretty good option for folks who want to have a little bit more of a direct flight. St. George Airport, again, is small and notorious uh, to get in and out of. So important things to keep in mind. Um, guests arriving on day one will be picked up by expedition leaders, whether that is the uh, shuttle stop or the St. George Airport. Um, so it is imperative that if you are traveling and expecting to be picked up by your expedition leaders, that you share those updates with the office. Um, you know, uh, if you have flight delays or anything like that, that would uh, preclude your arriving at, at your uh, prearranged time. Um, and guests arriving before day one will be responsible for their own travel to the hotel. Um, and so if you want to spend an extra day or two in the St. George area, which I would recommend, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, 
um, that will be on your own. Um, and most of us will depart again from the St. George Airport or the shuttle stop, um, basically the same way back. Um, and I should mention that the departure day will include a pretty long drive. It is about a two and a half hour drive from the North Rim Lodge. Um, and so, of course, our expedition leaders will accommodate depending on how early your flight is. But make sure it's, I think in the uh, literature, it says after 1 p.m. or afternoon or something like that. And so make sure to read up on that. Uh, money, all costs and gratuities of the trip for all of our various vendors, um, accommodations, um, helicopter flights, mule rides, things like that are included in your trip expense. And your expedition leaders and FOS will, excuse me, tip all of these folks that help us out to the highest of the industry standards. So you won't need to worry about that. Um, the only people you will need to worry about tipping on your trip are your expedition leaders. Um, and those guidelines are in the pre-departure briefing. Um, again, a lot of really good resources in the pre-departure briefing, more of an in, in detail um, description than I can give you. Um, as far as tipping goes, packing, of course, that reading list is in there as well. Um, and then, you know, of course, you'll need money for souvenirs, books, anything like that, you know, as we go through our visitor centers and go through those those nice shops to support the local, um, you know, Zion Forever program um, and conservation in the park, as well as, you know, some opportunities if you'd like to go into some, you know, art galleries in, in Springdale, just outside of Zion or anything like that as well. A um, couple of our vehicles. Uh, there's a nice photo of the mule ride um, there on the rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, there is a helicopter just outside. There's actually a photo of Zion, not Bryce, but similar helicopter um, outside of the park there. Um, and uh, of course, our chariots of choice. Uh, right bottom left there is a Mercedes Sprinter. Um, and then the bottom right is uh, sometimes we'll be leasing these uh, Ford E350s, which are also really nice and spacious. Um, I don't think we'll be using those, but I did include that photo in the off chance that we do. I think mostly we'll be in those uh, sprinter vans down there in the bottom left. Um, driving times, important things to keep in mind. You know, uh, the southwest, the desert of the southwest is quite expansive. And uh, while these parks are relatively close to each other, we'll be having some driving time between them. St. George to Bryce Canyon is about two hours, you know, straight. Bryce to Zion, about an hour and a half. Zion to the North Rim, two hours and 45 minutes. And the North Rim to St. George Airport, two hours and 50 minutes. Um, important things to keep in mind, there is quite a, a couple of driving days that are uh, expansive. Um, you know, uh, I should mention that in between all of our national parks, there are some really beautiful sites to see. Um, and I think that most of these days, it really doesn't feel like that long of a drive because we do have meaningful, beautiful stops in between each of these locations. Um, and so um, important things to keep in mind, you know, if uh, sitting in a car for long periods of time is, is uh, detrimental to your, uh, you know, your stomach, or your back or anything like that. These are things to keep in mind again, but we will, of course, all of our expedition leaders are trained to the highest degree of bathroom finding as well as uh, meaningful stop making along the way. So no worries about that. Here's a couple photos of our accommodations. Um, top left there, Bryce Canyon Lodge, beautiful roof there. Um, of course, a lot of these are old uh, railroad lodges built at the turn of the 19th century by the Santa Fe Railroad um, and being maintained by uh, different concessionaires. I think Aramark is uh, the concessionaire of Bryce and Grand Canyon. And then, of course, uh, Zantara there at Zion. Uh, Zantara Lodge, or sorry, Zion Lodge there at the top right, Grand Canyon Lodge at the bottom right. And I should mention on half of our departures this year, uh, they're in Zion National Park. Just because of the number of bookings by various tour groups, we will be staying at the Spring Hill Suites in Springdale, just outside of Zion National Park. As of course, you can see stunning views from the Spring from the Spring Hill Suites there as well. And actually, I will mention, you know, a much nicer hotel. <sighs> you know, in, in a lot of different aspects. And so I think there will be no detraction of our experience by staying in Springdale at all. Um, 
but important to note. Food, great food. Love the food on this trip. Some of my favorite restaurants in the entire world are in the Southwest, Springdale in particular. You know, uh, another guide and I spent a significant time last spring um, actually ramping up our food. So we're not eating um, at the Sizzler at Bryce Canyon City anymore, which is great. Not actually the Sizzler, but you know, a local restaurant that would very much resemble it. Um, just some really great food. All dietary restrictions will be accommodated for. Just make sure you disclose those to uh, Natural Habitat. Um, our field staff will have the information that's provided to them on them. Um, you know, we'll, we'll know about your allergies and those things, that, uh, but just make sure it's always a good idea in case of severe allergies to confirm with the field staff at the beginning of the trip. And, you know, a lot of people I've met who are celiac or things like that are really good about that at each individual restaurant as well. Um, and that's, those are things to keep in mind. Um, park lodges may be understaffed food wise, um, and they can be pretty slow. Again, just kind of COVID leftovers. Many of you are probably familiar with this throughout your various travels. <coughs> Group travel ethics, leave no trace principles, I'm sure you're all familiar with. We're gonna plan and prepare um, to leave no trace in the various places we'll be traveling through. Um, we're gonna travel on impacted surfaces, walking mostly on paved trails, um, sandy impacted areas. Um, we're gonna talk about cryptobiotic soil and how that's affected by a boot print in the sand very easily. Uh, we're gonna leave what we find in our, in our national parks. We're gonna respect the wildlife and be curious to other visitors. Um, smoking, if you're a smoker, um, that can be accommodated for. Of course, you're going to be need to, needing to do that far away from our vehicles and far away from any kind of park lodging or anything like that. So just let our expedition leaders know and we can um, make that happen. Uh, limit phone usage around others, especially in the van. You know, we're going to be traveling and that's the wonderful thing about traveling in natural habitat is all of our expedition leaders are well versed in the natural history and human history of these areas. And we're going to be talking about it, talking about what we see, giving stories about the area, about the culture. And so limiting phone usage while in the, in the car is particularly useful for us as we talk about what we're seeing rather than um, any other thing that's going on. And we're gonna avoid touchy conversational topics. So of course we'll talk about policy as, it, as in regards to the park service and management of our natural resources in this country. But um, maybe we'll leave conversations about the, uh, you know, hot button political topics or uh, you know any other touchy subjects like that at home for the week that we're traveling here and that is it um another beautiful picture of the grand canyon again taken by me less clouds this time <laughs> same day though so weather can change quite a bit over there um yeah that's uh that's kind of a down and dirty overview of our canyon store um this year um, and uh, thank you all for listening to me. We'll kind of move into our Q&A section. Back to you, Rob. All right. Thank you, Caden. Now, uh, before we start off with the question and answer session, I, I would like to remind everyone that if you do have questions, you can submit them via the question field in the control panel. All right. Let's get to a couple of these questions. So can you tell us exactly where St. George is? A lot of people haven't heard of St. George. St. George, if you look at a, a map of the state of Utah and you go to the bottom left corner, um, as I mentioned, uh, about 10 minutes north of the Arizona border and about half an hour east of the Nevada border. So really just right down there in the corner, um, St. George, Utah, I think the population of the greater St. George area is hovering around three 300,000 nowadays. Um, so yeah, right down there at the bottom, just about 45 minutes northeast of Las Vegas, if that's helpful for you. But yeah, I would uh, go go and look at a map. It's a really, really beautiful town there, as I mentioned, crossroads of three ecosystems. Um, and it is, uh, you know, quite accommodating. There's, um, you know, it's a modern Utah town. Great, thank you. So do you have any suggestions for those of us who are gonna come early or stay late for any additional hiking trips in the Grand Canyon area? Sure. Um, you know, you'll be staying earlier in St. George. Uh, Snow Canyon, I mentioned, is a state park that's, uh, oh, 15 minute drive out of town there. Um, really accessible um, right there out of town. 
Um, and we do, uh, you know, one or two little walks through there on our way up to Bryce Canyon that morning. Um, but there's definitely a lot more to do in, um, in the state park itself. And so that would be my first thought for sure, um, is to, uh, to spend some time in Snow Canyon State Park. Um, there's also a really beautiful uh, um, uh, river valley uh, over there, again, on the west side of town of St. George, if you look at a map. Um, called the Santa Clara River. And if you follow the Santa Clara River up toward Pine Valley, there are also a number of hiking trails, beautiful, um, nice waterfalls and things like that along the Santa Clara River. So those would be my recommendations. There are also a couple of um, petroglyph sites if you do a little bit more digging, um, but I'll leave that to y'all to dig for. <laughs> Great, thank you. So how much of Zion do we actually do? Are we going through... Uh all the sections or just one specific part so zion's a little bit of a funny a funny place um you know i mentioned it's a, a huge canyon you know a very very deep you know two thousand plus foot um cliff sides of this canyon here carved by the virgin river so the main area of the park is through the virgin river valley there um, there are a couple of different side canyons, Kolob Canyon, um, East Canyon we'll be driving through, but for the most part, most of that is backcountry permitted. So that's all backpacking, uh, multi-day trips, canyoneering, if uh, you're familiar with uh, some technical rope rock climbing type expeditions. A lot of that is in the backcountry, um, but we'll be seeing... Um, as far as the accessible portions of the canyon, we'll be seeing um, the vast majority, if not all, um, from the vehicle or hiking trail. And that would include the main canyon corridor itself, as well as the East Canyon um, there at the park. So if we're lucky enough to be able to drive to the area for our trip, is there a place for us to park our car? Yes, um, we had a couple of folks last year uh, park their car there. Uh, the um, hotel that we utilize there in St. George is the Hyatt. And um, it is uh, just across the freeway from kind of the main drag of town. And so um, typically parking is not a huge issue. It is a rather large parking lot. Um, and we, you know, we have a good relationship with the staff there. And so they've been, they've been very accommodating and been watchful of our vehicles as we've left them there in the Hyatt. Um, and that's been a good option for us. So yeah, definitely pretty easy. Um, no problem there. So a helicopter ride sure sounds fun, but if we're on the ground and uh, walking around, uh, Bryce, are we going to be disturbed by the helicopter noise or the animals going to be disturbed? No. So that's a great question, actually. Um, and I appreciate the, the forethought for the wildlife and of, of Bryce Canyon National Park. That's great. Um, you know, Bryce Canyon, um, in contrast to, to Zion, as I mentioned a second ago, um, is rather large. It is a plateau um, that is eroding on all sides of this plateau. Right. And so rather than it being a canyon where everything is kind of concentrated into a small space, uh, it's spread out. And a lot of the a lot of the amphitheaters um, are not accessible by foot. Um, some of the smaller amphitheaters, and most of them are, and the most beautiful ones definitely are. Uh, but a lot of those smaller little inlets and outlets are not accessible by foot, and that, so that's why um, we use the uh, helicopter tours. Um, but they uh, they do not they are not allowed into the large uh, populated amphitheaters of the park, and so I've I've actually never even seen them. Um, from the road uh, that we travel on. And so they travel and you'll definitely see all areas of the, uh, of the amphitheaters, but into those more remote sections of the park um, that are, again, inhospitable actually to a lot of wildlife um, more than, you know, deer, uh, but um, not getting close enough to the ground to really cause too much of an issue at all. So it's a great question. Great, thanks. So when we're hiking around uh, these national parks, are we going to have to worry about restroom facilities or are we going to be able to find places to go when we need to? I always get this question and it's always a great question. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, expedition leaders for NAT have, have a funny knack for finding bathrooms. I'll tell you, um, we're pretty dang good at it. Um, 
we uh I, I always recommend that everybody uh you know of course stay hydrated we'll be traveling through one of the drier sections of our country um you know throughout the trip and so um always staying hydrated we'll keep water um coolers in the back of each van to fill up throughout the day um and so yeah we'll on average make bathroom stops about every hour um, and that's almost like clockwork you know it's, it's a lot more of my job than uh, than than you'd think so no problem there great thanks for taking care of us we appreciate it unfortunately that will be the last question that we do have time for today so i'd like to hand it back to you for some closing comments thanks rob um yeah you know i i mentioned just on a personal note um when i i guide uh in glacier i guide in yellowstone i guide in acadia national park back east and when i get to spend time down in the desert um not only is it a peaceful serene experience um a lot of the time but it also feels like guiding in my backyard and um it's a special time i'm gonna be you know i i get to guide uh, down there at the end of may for nathab this year um that's kind of my first trip and i'm going to be spending basically the first two weeks of may um, down in the area as well. I can never get enough of it. I've been traveling there since I was seven years old. Um, and it's just truly beautiful country. And I hope that y'all can get out there. If not this year, then some future years, because it is a beautiful, beautiful place. So thank you all for tuning in. Kaden, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us Monday for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.